Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to interstitiallungdisease.info. In this episode today, I received a question about what is the best treatment for pulmonary fibrosis. If you're watching this as a video, this is it, from Ronaldo Rivera. Dr. Stefan, what's the best treatment for pulmonary fibrosis? So, very difficult question to answer, to be honest, because it depends on the type of fibrosis, it depends on the person who is suffering with the fibrosis. You all know these things because everyone is slightly different. So we need to approach it in this way, especially in this field that is very nuanced. So the difficulty that we have when treating pulmonary fibrosis is that the guidelines for making certain diagnoses change all the time. New information may become available in your case that may influence how we label your condition. Some drugs may be available in some areas of the world, some may not be. Also, there may be your individual tolerance to potential treatments that we can give. So all these factors play in. So if someone gives you a very simple answer that this is the best treatment for pulmonary fibrosis, I would say take that with a pinch of salt and discuss with your healthcare providers. Always, always, always go speak to your own doctors, your own nurses, healthcare professionals who know your case, who can really advise you in, in your situation, what is the best treatment for you? That's the important thing. What's the best treatment for you? So I can only provide you a theoretical answer in this video, but hopefully it gives you some insight about, about what is available at this point in 2023, September, um, because there's always new research going on. So maybe new treatments will emerge in 2024, 2025. It's, it's just a slow process sometimes to get new treatments researched and approved. But let's focus on what we have at hand. So at this moment, we need to understand in your case, what is the type of fibrosis that you have and what is causing the pulmonary fibrosis or the lung scarring. There can be very many causes for this. So this is important to understand. Your case will probably be very different than someone else you know who has told you that they have pulmonary fibrosis as well. And I see that in clinic all the time, to be honest. People, uh, actually, I think it was yesterday or the day before when I was in clinic and a patient told me that, oh, their neighbor across the road also has a condition that is fibrotic, fibrotic lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. And they were wondering whether they could be on the same treatment. Of course, the neighbor, completely unrelated case. So let's, let's just focus on what we can do in individual cases. So three main treatments, I would say, based on the situation in which someone may be finding themselves in. The first would be no treatment at all for the fibrosis. And you might find that strange, but actually in many cases, when we pick up lung scarring on a chest CT scan, for example, which you may have had for a different reason altogether, but lung scarring is being picked up at that stage. Sometimes it's important to understand how that fibrosis will behave over time. It may be that whatever triggered the lung scarring happened in the past. The damage has been done, but it's not really getting any worse. In those situations, going on a treatment may have risks that outweigh the benefits. The second category is if we have a way to remove the cause or to treat the cause of this fibrosis. And these are, again, a lot of conditions that can be lumped in, into this category, but potentially it could do with, it could be related to occupational lung disease. Uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or a connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease. And I'll explain what these mean. So if you have an op occupational lung disease, for example, perhaps you've been inhaling s large amounts of dust, organic dust, silica dust, uh, asbestos fibers, things like that. In those situations, stopping the exposure is the best treatment. The first treatment is stopping the exposure. Then we can discuss about other situations where we may provide some medication. But first of all, we need to stop whatever is doing damage to the lungs. If there is hypersensitivity pneumonitis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a fascinating lung disease, an interstitial lung disease in which the lungs react with strong inflammation to things that you've inhaled from the environment. And this could be generally organic dusts. So things that's generated from, from hay stacks. So you may have heard of farmer's lungs and things like that. It may be related to inhaling bird uh, proteins, so proteins that are originated from the feathers of birds and things like that, that we inhale and cause a reaction in the lungs. And that we see that fairly often as well. 
or it could be a lot of other things. People who uh, grow mushrooms sometimes may develop hypersensitivity in humanitis. People who use hot tubs depend uh, generally spending time in humid places where you can inhale these organic dusts or um, or dusts that may contain certain bacteria that trigger an inflammation in the lungs, not an infection, but just inflammation. And that long-term, low-grade exposure to, to that inhaled trigger can lead to progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And we call that hypersensitivity pneumonitis, an overtly sensitive reaction of the lungs to whatever we inhale. In those situations, we can remove, obviously, the trigger, so that's important, main thing would be to try to remove whatever's doing damage, whatever's triggering the lungs. But also sometimes we can provide anti-inflammatory treatments because it's an inflammatory lung condition. So sometimes we can start treatment with steroids, corticosteroids or prednisolone, for example. And that may be carried on for maybe a year, two years, more, depending on how your lungs are behaving or how the condition is behaving. So again, I insist on the fact that we need to understand how your disease behaves in your case. And the third category that I mentioned is connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung disease. And I mentioned that's, that's a very long name, apologies, but that's how, how it's classified now. now. A connective tissue disease is basically a, a condition affecting the general um, connective tissues of the body. So things like uh, rheumatological disease, so things like rheumatoid arthritis, so inflammatory arthritis, can sometimes also affect the lungs. There is inflammation in the joints, in the joints and the fingers, uh, but also in the lungs, and that can lead to pulmonary fibrosis. So obviously in that situation, we need to treat the rheumatoid arthritis first to make sure that that's well controlled, because that would control the inflammation both in the joints and in the lungs. So a rheumatologist might be the person who will be leading the treatment in that case. Uh, other Connective tissue diseases may include things like systemic sclerosis, where there is usually thickening of the skin on, uh, on the fingers, on the face. Uh, that's, again, an inflammatory condition. Sometimes the rheumatologist will prescribe treatment for that first, and then we may consider other treatments for the lung scarring associated with it specifically. So there can be a lot of connective tissue diseases that can cause lung scarring as well. The, but the treatment is with anti-inflammatory agents, usually corticosteroids or steroids, as they're referred to. Sometimes we may need to provide very high doses at the beginning, depending on the type of inflammation, on the type of connective tissue disease. And basically that will be the first treatment. Then we may move on to providing other medications, which is the third category. So the third category is where we have lung scarring of either an unknown cause or where we cannot really put our fingers on a specific cause that's responsible for all of the fibrosis. There may be many things that have, uh, have happened in that case, maybe occupational exposures, a connective tissue disease that's not fully blown. So there can be, it's, it's, it's complicated. So you may have cases where there is an unknown type of lung scarring, or um, we cannot really explain it particularly well, or we have a known cause, for example, occupational, um, maybe hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, maybe a connective tissue disease, but despite the treatment, despite removing the triggers from the environment, that condition is still getting worse, the scarring process is still getting worse despite uh, stable good treatment for the the known cause. So I know that sounds a little bit complicated, but basically just to summarize again, uh, because I need to get into the last category where we talk about antifibrotic agents. So there may be no need for treatment if the condition is stable, if the pulmonary fibrosis is stable. We may need to treat the cause if it is an occupational exposure, removing that. If it's a trigger from the environment, not being exposed to that trigger again. If it's a connective tissue disease, a systemic condition, a condition affecting the general body that's inflammatory in nature, treating the inflammation. And then there's this third category where we have lung fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, lung scarring of an un unknown cause or a known cause that despite well um, conducted treatment for that co known cause, removing the cause, it's still getting worse. And that last category is where people generally focus on when we talk about antifibrotic treatment or anti-scarring medication. So anti-scarring medication um, can include at this point in time, September 2023, two medications only, which, is which are perfenidone or 
nintadenib. These are the only two that we've got. They both have slightly different side effect profiles. Both of them are approved for the treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, or, or it's translated in a simple talk, lung scarring of an unknown cause. That's IPF. We can't find the cause. We've ruled out, ruled out potential causes, can't find the cause. It's lung scarring, it's progressing over time. In those situations, we can prescribe both pyrfenidone or nintedanib. Both drugs are available. However, there is also in the scope of antifibrotic treatments at this point of time, there is an approval in most parts of the world for using nintedanib, so one of the two drugs, for progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases. So that means that if we have lung fibrosis, doesn't matter what the cause is, if the patients are stable, are on good treatment for the cause, that we've removed the occupational exposure, but that lung scarring is still progressing, nintedanib is approved for use in that case. But we need to demonstrate that there is progression. So that's why we need monitoring. So we would need to generally demonstrate that the radiology images, so the CT scan images, the chest CT scan images are getting worse over time. There's more fibrosis over the span of one to two years. It's getting worse. The lung function is declining. So the capacity of the lung is shrinking over time. So that's done by serial lung function measurements. So you will do the breathing tests maybe every three, six months, yearly lung function. It's going down. It's an indication together with the radiology that the lung function is getting worse. And also symptoms, respiratory symptoms are getting worse. So more coughing, more breathlessness. If all these things are met, you are on a treatment for a known cause of the fibrosis and we've removed all the triggers and it's still getting worse. In those situations, we can use nintedanib as a way to slow down the progression. Now, nintedanib and pyfenidone, those antifibrotic agents, those antifibrotic treatments that I've mentioned, they actually do not reverse the fibrosis. So it's important to mention this to you, that they don't cure the disease. However, what they do is they reduce the rate of decline, the rate of progression of the fibrosis. So basically, someone who is generally on antifibrotic treatment compared to someone who is not on antifibrotic treatment will have different outcomes. So someone who is on antifibrotic treatment, maybe in three years from now, if they tolerate the treatment well, if they're on antifibrotic treatment, will probably bet be better off than someone who, with the same condition who isn't on that treatment. So it does provide a benefit, of course. It does lengthen the game, let's say, but it doesn't reverse the scarring. And generally, it's not expected that it will improve symptoms. There is work in this regard that there may be some effect initially on the lung function to, to improve it somewhat. That's been communicated in some, some recent um, congresses and papers. But however, it's not entirely clear. There's more research going on in this area, but generally going on antifibrotic treatment will reduce the rate of decline in the, in the lung uh, fibrosis. So it will slow down its progression and potentially it may prevent exacerbations or flare-ups of the pulmonary fibrosis. So these are situations in which someone may be triggered, someone who has pulmonary fibrosis may be triggered by having a viral infection or something else in the environment triggers. We don't know exactly, we don't understand it very well, but sometimes it can trigger a massive acceleration of the fibrosis. It's as if the fibrosis is progressing slowly, slowly, uh, and then there is an acute event, something happens, an exacerbation of the fibrosis, a flare up, and then the lung function really drops quite significantly and then it's really hard to recover from that so it just it's something that is important to look at there's it's really hard to do these sort of studies where we try to examine how these drugs may prevent exacerbations because there are pulmonary fibrosis generally the the lung fibrosis uh, diagnosis they're quite rare conditions so it's hard to do those studies so it seems that Antifibrotic treatment reduces the rate of progression of the fibrosis. It prevents some of the exacerbations and it can be added on to other treatments for a known cause. So I think this was uh, the video today. I'll probably need to wrap it up because it's getting longer and I hope it wasn't too confusing. Unfortunately, if I have to answer the question, what is the best treatment for pulmonary fibrosis? I have to give that answer individually to every person. It doesn't um, there's no one, uh, one answer for everyone, unfortunately. And I think anyone who tells you that there is, 
is probably lying to you. And actually, just be mindful of what you're reading online. This is just uh, to an anecdote when I'm completing the, the video. Just be mindful that you may see comments on my videos and on forums online that are j for sure spam, okay? So just be sure that you're reading uh, the right information. Like, for example, I don't know what this is, a user BD1G, this is a random username. And then uh, Dr. Pius, uh, whatever, is always compassionate, empathetic. What are these things, right? Okay, so these um, these are spammy things. So be careful what you're reading online. So be take everything that you're reading online about pulmonary fibrosis, about lung conditions with a pinch of salt. Discuss it with your healthcare providers. Also, when you're talking about supplements, about uh, other things that you may do for your pulmonary fibrosis, try to see them in your own uh, specific condition, um, if that would work. Because even the treatments that I mentioned before, while they may be working in theory, if you cannot tolerate them, if they're affecting your quality of life, that's probably not going to be helpful for you. So sometimes not going on treatment may actually be the better option for some people who have a lot of other conditions, a lot of health problems. It's a judgment call to make with your own healthcare providers. Hope this was helpful. If you have further questions, leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you in future videos or episodes if you're listening this, uh, to this in audio. All the best and good health.